don't miss it. The blessing that we see and the good ministry that goes on each and every year through VBS is just unparalleled. And so, man, if you want to see God work in some amazing ways, don't miss it. Amen? Good morning. How wonderful it is to be here today and to enjoy the Lord and to worship with you guys. Let's open our Bibles, John chapter 1. We're, we've been studying verse by verse through the book of Revelation, taking one more week to tackle this topical message from John chapter 1, balancing grace and truth, if you want to write that down in your bulletin, balancing grace and truth. Writing down helps us to remember, and the Lord just does some incredible work when we write down, take in in that second and important way, not just visually, but somehow something's written on our hearts at times when we're taking good notes in a Bible study or in our devotion, and so I encourage you to do that. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we're so thankful that you're here today. We're so thankful that your word is open before us. Your word is truth. And that's what you said. Sanctify them. Set them apart. By your truth, your word is truth. We are so thankful for your truth. The truth. This word of God. Singular. The word of God. Thank you for all that it is and all that it does. We love your word here in this fellowship and in Calvary Chapel, the, the fellowship of churches that we're a part of. We love your word. And yet, God, we're in need of a reminder this morning. I know I am and have been and will be in need of the reminder, the importance of balancing your truth with your grace. The ultimate open door that grace is. Ultimate access, absolute power. So much, Lord, that we seem to be lacking in these last days. Give us a balance as we see the beauty of grace and truth at work in the ministry of our Lord, perfectly, just harmoniously ministering in grace and truth. Impart something to us today. Talk to us today, God, about how important it is to utilize these tremendous divine gifts that you've given. In Jesus' name, Lord, for your glory, let's say together, amen. We're kind of going to hone in on verse 14, but let's read starting in verse 1. This is one of the most beautiful chapters in the entire Bible, so let's read a part of it. John begins his gospel in this way. He says he's writing all these things so we would know that Jesus Christ is Lord, that in his name there's salvation for sin. But he introduces Jesus in like the most eloquent and poetic and powerful of ways. It's, it's, it's prophecy. It's just incredible. Enough about it. Let's read it. Verse 1, John says, In the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He... Who are we talking about here? He was in the beginning. Very nice audience participation. You know I like that. Thank you. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of that light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light, kind of like us. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Love that verse. He, verse 10, Jesus, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, the Jewish nation, his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who what? Believe, that's it. Believe in his name. 
who were born, this is getting good, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. How much more can God say this? But born of God, that's the key. Born of the Spirit, born again. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, John says, and we beheld, we saw it, we watched it, day in and day out. It's fact to us, it's absolute truth. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only one from the Father. What does it say? Full. And what a thing for John to say, we beheld his glory. What is that, like shining light and stuff? Well, that's part of it. But here's the ultimate manifestation of it, full of, full of both grace and truth. John the Baptist bore witness of him, cried out saying, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but what? Grace and grace truth not just one but both grace and truth full of grace and truth grace and truth came through who jesus christ john chooses to describe jesus as he introduces us to him as he introduces jesus to the world remember he's writing to his generation those alive on the earth and every generation that would follow this is the ultimate testimony of who jesus christ is And how is John inspired to write? Well, in a couple different ways, but primarily focusing on the fullness in Jesus Christ that John saw of grace and truth. We saw him uh, 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 early in the morning through late at night, every single day, three years. We've watched him. We've observed him. I know him, John could say, and here's what we saw. Here's what I see, full of grace and truth. He perfectly personified both the grace of God, which is essential. Essential, as we'll see this morning. We're going to talk a lot about grace. I think oftentimes we're a little lopsided. We're leaning a little more. If you're leaning this way, that is, to too much grace and not enough truth, we're going to go back the other way, right? But if we're leaning a little too much toward truth, we're going to bring it back in the middle preaching grace, that these things may be balanced in our lives. Consider that for just a moment as that picture is kind of before us. Jesus, the perfect blend, the perfect balance of grace and truth, most times we're not, right? This is an issue that the church has always had and that it always will have in every generation. No matter where we are in the globe, it's going to be difficult for us to balance both the truth of God, that is his word, unchanging, unrelenting, and the grace of God. And we'll talk about exactly what that is in a minute. It's always going to be an issue. I think we should just accept that and just say, okay, Lord, I want to, I desire to balance grace and truth just as Jesus did. Obviously, a successful ministry, a fruitful life. What was it about Jesus that had such an impact on every person that he talked to, right? Every person that he served and went to and had conversation with and all the fruitful ministry that came through his life, well, it was because we might say he's full of both. He's full of grace and truth, not just one, but both. I was at a pastor's conference this week, and this was our theme, grace and truth. We just talked about it from every angle, I think. Grace and truth, grace and truth, how essential Each element is for the Christian life, but how they must be blended together in order to be balanced and to be effective. I really think, at least for me, this is a a real prophetic word, a real word from the Lord. It's important for us to take the time and consider this today. I do think, and maybe you can look into your life, man, we've got a lot to learn from the Lord, Um, again, as as we seek to be those who balance both grace and truth. Can you amen that? We're going to talk about this today, and as I said, no doubt we're going to talk about grace a little bit more, bringing in truth toward the tail end. Because as I, as I said to the first service, you know, in Calvary Chapel, this, this, this fellowship of churches that we're a part of, we have a passionate zeal for the truth. I'm born and raised in the Bible and all these kinds of things. Have a devotion to the scriptures that is just, it's, it's serious. 
And yet oftentimes in my own ministry and in my own life, grace has been lacking. And that's a maturity thing in part two. Uh, and so what a, what a good opportunity for us to consider the perfect blend of both grace and truth that we see in Jesus Christ. And then to go our way asking the Lord to equip us to live as he did and minister as, as he did. Uh, write this down if you would. What is grace? I think this is essential. I think this is important. Uh, what is grace? And we'll give definition to that. Write that down. Consider that with me for just a moment. Biblically, grace is applied to God. I don't think mankind originally, naturally knows anything of what grace is. Grace is, and again, the ultimate definition or expression comes from the Lord. We're going to look to God to define, to exemplify what grace is, because when we do, we're going to find that we really don't have it. We really don't know anything about it. Can you amen that? Grace is unmerited favor. It's just a look of love. It's favor that can't be earned or, or bought or paid back. It's just the goodness, the kindness, we would say the love of God. The love that he has, the kindness that he has toward us. And thus that love is manifested, that grace is, is, is exhibited in so many practical ways. We could say that grace is consideration. Grace is care, and that is practically, physically care. I like that the word for love predominantly in the New Testament, in the King James, is the word charity. Most of us know what the word agape means. It's love, selfless love, giving, expecting nothing in return, not being interested, give me accolades, give me praise, give me cash, whatever the case may be. I thought that was funny. You didn't. That's okay. But giving with nothing to be given in return. Charity, we kind of get that, right? Charity is a little closer. And that's a great definition for that word agape, that word love. We're kind of in tune with that. But even in these last days, uh, 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 the grace of God, the love of God goes beyond charity. Uh, the goodness of God, the kindness of God doesn't get a tax receipt, right? It, it doesn't ask for a, a, a nonprofit, you know, donation slip. We're always looking for some little way to repay ourselves for the goodness and the kindness and the charity that we do. And that's not what this is. Again, grace is simply the favor of God. You've got it in its fullness. There's nothing you can do to change it or take it away. It's already yours. It's a gift that God has given. It's a, an element of his nature. It's a part of his character. And it's freely given. God's grace is ultimately his love, and that love is given, this grace is afforded for every single person who will ever live, as we read in this passage. Grace is for everyone. Uh, there will be those who will say, well, hold on now. Don't you love that? God's grace is only coming upon, falling upon, relevant to those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, and that's just not true. In fact, we just read this passage which says, the opposite. God's favor, as we'll go on to see, his kindness, his love is extended upon every person who will ever live, regardless of whether or not they're saved or will be saved or not. They have the favor, they have the affection, they have the kindness of God, that look of love. I look on you and I love you. That is the grace of God. Now, we have a real hard time with grace as religious people. Can we call ourselves for this morning recovering religious people? Because in reality, that's like where we're at all the time. Thank you, some of you. We're like recovering religious people. And we go like back into the, the sick, deep end of the pool sometimes. We begin to get confused and think that we're relating to God based on our goodness or our not-so-goodness, right? That's not what this is. But we're always like recovering from this religious, works-based relationship with God. I think in so many ways. That being the case, grace is hard to explain. You say something like that we just did, right? God loves the whole world. God looks on favorably every person, no matter who they are, where they're from, what they'll do. He looks on them with affection and love. He manifests his kindness to them. That's hard to explain because we want a reason. We want like a rationale. We want to say, well, this is why, because God knew they'd do something good. And then in the end, it's all equitable and fair and it, you know, works out. We've earned the favor of God. That's not what grace is. Amen? 
There's no explanation for the goodness and grace of God, why he would love us, why he would be good or kind to us. David wrote about this in Psalm 8, verse 3. It's in the NIV. And he said this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, when I look at the universe, how big it is, and it's like growing, and it's diverse, and it's just, it's just, you know, it leaves us speechless. What is man, he says. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them, You have made them, think this stuff through, this is radical, a little lower than the angels. Oh, well. Crown them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You made the earth. You set the planet spinning, and yet you put us over it. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim, the paths or the currents of the seas. It's a mystery to me, Lord, when I look at creation and I see just its majesty, what is man, who am I, who are we, that you'd look on us, that you'd love us, that you'd give favor and grace and and all these things to us. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But here's how he ends. He says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I mean, you're just good. David starts the psalm with kind of this question. What's the deal with grace, God? And he ends with words of worship and praise. That, by the way, is the point of grace, right? For us to not look for some reason. Good job, buddy. You know, I did did well. You know, good job. You earned the grace of God. But to lift two hands and worship to the Lord and say, God, this is all about you. And and because of your goodness, because of your love, I want to respond with worship, with service. I want to be loyal to you. I want to exchange affection with you. The grace of God is a phenomenal work leading someone to salvation and ushering us through that sanctification process as Christians. It's the love of God. It's his grace that melts my stubborn will and leads me and just put into work the principles of Scripture. Amen? We can look through the Word This word of truth, by the way, grace and truth, you're with that, right? And we can see God's grace, we can see his love practically manifested all over the place. That's Communion Sunday, man, we we held it in our hands, right? The gift of grace, the gift of salvation that God has given us in Jesus Christ. I think of John 3, 16, firstly, and this is, I pray still, our favorite verse, because there are no strings attached, There's no works involved. Nothing associated but belief. This is the grace of God to me, manifested most clearly to the lost. For God so loved the world. Goodness, grace, favor, unmerited, unearnable. You didn't do anything to get it. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, you like that word? I do. I need that to be true that whoever believes in him would not perish or die, but have everlasting life. Chapter goes on. You can read it. God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. I mean, that's grace right there. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Don't add to it. Don't take it away from it. Just, I pray, receive it, right? God's word of grace to the lost. How about a a word of God's grace to we Christians, we who are already saved. How about Romans 8, 28? Talk about grace and the the favor of God. I love this verse. We rarely quote verse 29, so let's do that. Paul said, and we know that God causes what? Everything. I like that word too. Everything to work together for the good, but there's a A clarification here, right? Of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. This applies to only Christians. But if you are a Christian, everything, 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 God promises to twist it and work it and turn it and mold it and shape it toward to something good. The things we do just in absolute foolishness and folly. There's no excuse for stumbling or failing or whatever the case may be. God says, I got this. 
that is incredible to me. That is God's promise if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. This is the grace that Jesus has purchased for you on the cross of Calvary by his blood through his death. That's amazing to me. Are you encouraged today? You smile about that because you're a sinner, right? You messed up this morning. Like five minutes ago, something came in and you're like, man, this is great. All things he's working together for good, for some good outcome, and you'll get there. It'll happen. You'll see it. This is incredible to me, but it doesn't stop there. Verse 29 says, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. We hold Jesus on a high pedestal, and we should. I mean, Lord and Savior and God, our I am, and, and, and all these things, right? But God is going to make you like him. That's incredible. That's incredible to me. That's goodness. That's grace. God is going to do this work so that his son would be the preeminent one among many brothers and sisters, invited into the family, brought up onto the throne, onto the pedestal. Come up here, buddy. I'm going to make something of you. That is phenomenal grace. You don't deserve that. You're not worthy of this. I can't imagine being a part of that, but yet that's what the word of truth tells us. Talk about grace. We are a rich people. We've got a lot to give away, I think, and that's kind of the point of God's grace. I pray that captures you. One more example for you as far as how grace is practically demonstrated. We talk about God's grace uh, to the lost, God's grace upon we Christians, and we to have the opportunity to experience God's grace and pour it out on those who don't know the Lord. To that I, I see Luke chapter 10. Why don't you write that down? That of course is the parable of the Good Samaritan, and that's a important concept for us to consider in these last days. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we dig into grace. But that is grace, that is favor, that is love, that is charity demonstrated, you know, practically, perfectly, doing good for those that we're kind of not supposed to, doing good to those who are even our enemies. That's what we do because through that process, we're able to share the Lord and lead them to the Lord. Able to pour out grace because we're walking in and enjoying grace ourselves. Can you amen all that? Four points for you quickly on grace. And as I said earlier, we're going to talk a little bit more about grace and then bring in truth toward the tail end because I really do think our time is well spent considering the powerful gift that God's grace is. The power of God at work through us in the world. We're going to make four observations on the power of of this gift of grace that God has given us. Firstly, note this with me, write it down. Grace freely offers the gift of salvation to absolutely anyone. That's what grace is. That's what grace does. We've just defined it. It's unmerited. It's nothing we get in return. It's available to all. And grace is so radical because grace can go to people. Grace can go to places that law never would and never will. And oftentimes in our, our zeal for the truth, we miss the point and purpose of grace. God's grace, again, is the power of God, and it's able to save to or from the uttermost, man. One Bible teacher said the guttermost, right? Those deep down in just the gut, man, the miry, uh, uh, the gutter, the miry clay, just burdened and bondaged, covered in sin. That's where grace goes. Grace is excited. There's no person too far to receive the gospel through the extension of grace that you and I can be, that we must be. Freely offers the gift of salvation to absolutely anyone. Grace isn't intimidating to any idolater, to a murderer. To a refugee, watch out for those refugees, man. Politically, we're being like spun in circles. And oftentimes, not all the times, but oftentimes, we're missing opportunity. Islamic terrorist or whatever. Yep, grace can get them too. Grace is not intimidated. Grace is not a, 
afraid. If it's an adulterer, if it's a pedophile, a pornographer, if it's a homosexual, grace is not intimidated. Grace goes to those who need the gospel. And there's nothing that keeps grace away. Nothing. No wall, no line, no border, no boundary. I like to look at Matthew 13 and the parable of the sower. And this is from Jesus. You can disagree with this if you want. We'll love you. God bless you. This is Jesus talking about preaching the gospel, right? The seed is not money. Uh, the seed is the gospel. And so Jesus gives this parable about how we are to disperse and dispense the gospel. We're not to hold it back. We're not to limit it. We're not to say, hmm, are they worthy of the gospel? Uh, do I think they'll respond? Do I get them? Do I like them? That effeminate man, well, see, I don't really like that, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my pouch closed. Do you know what I'm saying? Or like that really weirdly dressed person or whatever it is. Grace does not do that. Grace dispenses uh, broadly. And read that parable. Uh, the sower's not responsible for how the seed is received, but the sower is responsible to take that seed and just chuck it out there over here and over there. And I don't know what they're going to do with it, but I'm going to get the seed out there with no strings attached no requirements, that's what grace does. In your present condition, however far from God you might be, no change is required. I'm just going to give you the seed of the gospel. And I'm going to let the Lord have his work. I'm going to trust that God, a sovereign God, is able to you know, reach down as they reach up or however that works. I'm going to freely give uh, the gospel of peace to any person regardless of where they're at or what's going on in their life. That's our primary purpose as Christian. That's what grace gives us the ability to, to do. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing to me. Secondly, closely tied to that but different. Grace, grace is a fearless evangelist. That picture was just in my head this week. Grace is afraid. We freely offer the gospel. That's what grace does. But grace is fearless when it comes to uh, 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 sowing the seed and preaching the gospel. Love this. Grace is never intimidated. Grace is not afraid of any addiction, of any sinful lifestyle that oftentimes we are. We see the sickness of sin, and sometimes it's sick, and it's upside down, and it's backwards, and it's not right. But again, we get our eyes on the person. We see the sin, and we're like, well, you know, I'm not so sure. They'll never come around, or they're caught up in this, and this, this border or this boundary is going to keep them, so I'm just going to you know, hold the seed in my, in my pouch here. What did we talk about first service? We talked about how that Satan, and we're seeing him be successful in this area in these last days, and this is not good. He builds strongholds in people's lives, you know, big old castles and fortified walls. He wants to trap them in by their sin to isolate them from the gospel. We've been given, and I'm getting Pentecostal, sorry, we've been given the keys to the kingdom. We can pray and tear down strongholds. We can go through closed doors with the light of God, piercing the darkness with grace and give them the seed of the gospel, and that'll overcome anything that the enemy, you know, brings into their lives. Grace knows no boundaries, no borders. It has no limitations. As we said, the gospel of grace is the power of God. You know, and we're running into more and more these days, right? You've got, you know, a, 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 whatever the case may be, a person who's your enemy coming against you to murder you, and we call them, you know, terrorists or refugees. Well, the gospel's bigger than that. The gospel has the power to change a person radically from the inside out. We look on... Uh, 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 you know, same-sex couples, right? And they're married with kids these days. And we're like, I don't know what to do about that. And so we do nothing. We're afraid. We're intimidated. We say, well, they're married, you know, and what do, what do we do? We get caught up in the specifics, and that's not our business. Our business is to freely, radically give the gospel. God loves you right where you are right now. No change is required but that you believe, right? And we'll get to the truth in a second. That's it. Oh, he's addicted to that, or oh, she's a part of this, or it doesn't matter. We're distracted oftentimes. We, we impart the wrong idea. Well, you're going to have to turn from that, you know. Why would they do that? They're not saved yet, right? 
We know better. You know why? We have a new nature. And we listen to the Holy Spirit. Husbands, we said to the first service, we'll we'll pick on the wives this service. You know when you say something foolish to your husband and you're overworked and you're tired and you're like, knock it off or whatever you say that's unkind or offensive to your husband. He works hard. He comes home. He's doing his best. So you say something offensive or inappropriate. And then, you know, a few minutes later, you're doing your thing and the Holy Spirit's like, ah, got me. That's called conviction. We can repent and go make it right. That's what it is to be born again. Hey, guess what? Non-Christians don't have that experience. They don't know that. They're not familiar with this. So what is so normal to us is foreign to them, right? So why do we hold them to a Christian standard when they're not Christians, right? Give them. Grace just knocks over the tables and busts through the door, and it says believe. Just believe. You don't have to change at all. But after you do, you will. I mean, it's, it's really just that simple, and I'm going on and on, I know. It's good news. People aren't interested in what they don't know exists. People don't know. They don't know. You can see it at work in your life. They can hear you talk about it. But they're not going to change until they embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible calls us ambassadors. We're ambassadors like pleading with the world. Come, 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 come. Come to the Lord Jesus and be saved from sin. The Lord's going to work it out. As we'll go on to see, we have the privilege as Christians of walking with uh, newly saved believers out of sin and closer to the Lord. Let's talk about that. Thirdly, Grace, how it empowers us, how it's appropriately applied by us. Thirdly, grace lifts the head of the stumbling, struggling Christian. Grace lifts the head of the stumbling, struggling Christian to the one who says, and you said this recently, didn't you? You know how I know? Because I did too. Man, I blew it again. I stumbled, I fell, I didn't want to, part of me did, but... I regret it. I wish it never happened. God, forgive me. We, we go through these cycles and processes. I've stumbled. I've fallen. I'm a bad boy. I'm not a good girl. And thus, you know, God must be upset with me. And I, I, can't, I can't ask the Lord for things. I can't come. I, I can't really lift my hands and worship today because, you know, I've been into sinful things. And these cycles of separation that we go through when it comes to sin, that is not grace. And by kind of engaging in this pity party, we're making less of the cross of Jesus Christ. Oh, I just gotta, I gotta get back into the good graces of God. No, you already have the fullness of his grace. Jesus died to purchase you that grace to where when God looks on you, he sees no sin. We need to treat each other this way. And oftentimes we treat ourselves this way, right? Ha, thank God for grace, man, I'm, I'm good, right? I blew it, but I'm fine. And then we like go to our brother or our sister and, oh, I can't believe you did that. You know, God. It's our privilege as believers, brothers and sisters, to lift the head of that stumbling, repentant sinner and saying, yeah, you're guilty. Yeah, you've blown it. But the fact that you are crushed right now and ashamed is the surest evidence of your salvation because if you weren't, you wouldn't care, right? We think it's our job sometimes, and I've done this, our job to really just, yeah, you know, you feel, you need to feel bad for a while. Like just, you you know, like someone falls and we kick them while they're down, right? You just need, yeah, yeah. Are, Are you feeling bad enough yet? I've done this. I've done this in counseling. God help me. Pray for me. Years ago. I just had a memory pop in my head, you know, and the fruits of repentance are going to be born, but the confession of sin is the surest sign of salvation, and it's our part at that time to pick them up and dust them off and walk with them into more fruitful living, right? We enjoy grace for ourselves, and that's good. We must, we should, I pray you do. Stop beating yourself up about doing what 
God knows you will do. Paul and his words are so important for us. He says, I do that which I do not want to do. There's a war going on. So I want to live wisely so I can live fruitfully and be an example to others. But stumbling is a part of the Christian life. I wish we would talk about that a little bit more and I'll do my part. I'll do my best. Amen. Paul said this in Galatians 6.1. He said, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, beat them while they're down. Man, kick them out of church. This is a perfect sanctuary and we're perfect. What a lie that is, right? And yet that's the idea oftentimes that we, that we promote, that a stumbling sinner can't come in and feel comfortable. That's not good. He says, if, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. That's what you're called to do. Getting truthy here. Getting truthy. We'll get to truth in a minute. But it's essential, right? Have enough grace to fulfill the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, don't you love verses like this? You're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. I love this. Grace gives us the ability to reach out, to restore, and to rebuild those who are stumbling and falling. And what a privilege that is because we need it ourselves. Lastly, again, tied to this, but so often not mentioned in the body of Christ, grace gives space for growth in God's kids. Grace gives space or time for God's kids to grow up. This is radical. This is like, you know, you might get offended and walk out kind of stuff. I hope you don't. It's not our heart. We'll get to truth. Trust me, we'll get to truth. But right now we're just uh, 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 releasing, just unleashing the grace of God and all that it's present for and all that it can do. Grace gives us the ability to overlook the minor mistakes of those who were new to the faith. Sin! we say. And everybody's scared. Oh, did he point at me? Like, oh, he knows he saw. That's not what we do. Sin, right? That's what we do. That's how we live. Oftentimes, we, we, we are holding to such a high standard, and that's fantastic. I'm to hold the highest standard in this room. That's tough, but that's called leadership. It's called maturity. That's called accountability, right? Right? You can amen that. That's good. But the standard to which we hold ourselves is not the standard that we hold to those who are newer in the faith, those who are learning and growing. They're maturing. They're, they're brand new. They're babes. You don't hold a two-year-old to the same standard of life and living. You don't hold them accountable in the same way that you would a full-grown adult. Right? I'm learning about kids. Bunch of kids. New puppy feel like a little more of me has died. That's good. It's good for me. Come on, brother. It's good for me. You know, ginormous blended family, if that's what it is. I don't know. At any rate, uh, I've got a two-year-old and a 13-year-old, and, and you know this stuff. You don't treat them the same way because they're different. They're in different levels of maturity. My daughter, my two-year-old, just can't even keep like her peas on the tray, man. And, and <laughs> that's frustrating. That's difficult, that's dirty business, and yet it's perfectly appropriate for her maturity level and where she's at and how she understands. And I could say to myself, well, I told her not to do that. And you who have two-year-olds, you laugh at me and point and mock and ridicule. You should. That's, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous, right? Even for a 13-year-old, that's ridiculous, you know? But we kind of do these things, and we get caught up in that stuff as Christians. And, and I don't know why, Maybe it's because we secretly want to be sinful. Maybe that's the case. But our job, our purpose is to not point fingers and to ostracize and kick out of the church and exercise discipline when they're just a baby and they're trying to grow up in the Lord. Maybe it's an issue of rebellion. Maybe I'm living in sin and no one's going to tell me different. Okay, well, that's when discipline comes into the picture. But that's not our first response, a criticizing, judgmental attitude, right? <laughs> Let me think about it for a minute. I have to be so careful of this stuff. 
So, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, let's say you're in conversation with a person and, you know, something slips and something's said and something, you know, maybe a curse word is, you know, thrown out there and are you, uh, do you freak out? Um, you know, we've got to give people space to grow in God. Don't we have, if we're new creations in Christ, we are uh, born again. We have the nature of God within us, his Holy Spirit, which says, you know, knock it off. And they're like, whoa, uh, the Spirit of God really is in me and really does speak to me and I need to listen. That's a process that takes time and space to figure out. It's our job, if you're mature, and if you are, then you will. To just walk them through this, this, this period of life however long it takes to be patient, to be encouraging. Not to be just, man, you know, we're just so critical in these last days, I think, oftentimes. Um, when someone comes to Christ, that's a messy thing. And there are all kinds, there's a whole world that needs to be cleaned up. That's not your job. That's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And guess what? He'll do that. He'll do it. Maybe not as you or I see fit or as quickly as we would like, but that's his business, and he's going to start cleaning this up and scrubbing over there and adjusting this and maturing that, and before long, all these issues are going to be taken care of or to a whole lot more noticeable degree. That is what grace affords us. The grace of God is upon this person's life, and it's not my place, it's not my part to be hypercritical and overly sensitive and all these things. Parenting is really hard work, and, and so is this. And the patience that's required, uh, the self-sacrifice that oftentimes is necessary, and that's just part of the deal. Again, I think we're so inclined, our zeal for the truth, right? Our zeal for the truth, and man, we're zealous. I'm zealous for the truth. Black and white. We'll get there. Oftentimes, that becomes out of balance, and I'm cutting out and kicking people away and separating and breaking fellowship, and they're just like a two-year-old, you know, kicked to the curb and sitting out in the cold like, you know. Uh, it's messy business to make disciples, and I pray we remember that and remember that grace gives us the uh, enablement, the freedom to raise God's kids. Peter said this, 1 Peter 5, 2, new living. He said, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. That's what we're called to do. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you were eager to serve God. You want to please the Lord? Well, serve his people, man. Little, get that little napkin and like wipe their little cheeks, you know, got their carrots and peas and stuff and change their diapers and these kinds of things. He says, don't lord it over. Don't lord your authority over the people that you've been assigned to care for, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. In the same way, you young guys accept the authority of the elders. And all of you serve each other in humility, for God opposes the proud but favors the humble. Amen? Grace, man, it's great. It's good news. There's freedom. There's ministry. It opens doors and just gives opportunity, and there's such kindness and love and affection and all these great things. We love grace, right? But grace without truth, guys, grace without truth, boy, what's the point? What is the purpose? Grace without truth is dangerous. It's destructive, and it could be damnable. Warren Wiersbe said this, truth without love is brutality, and love without truth is what? Love without truth is hypocrisy. There's just no point. There's no purpose. There's no beauty. There's no color. Uh, 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 tr grace is stripped of all its meaning and identity if there's not truth to uphold it, to enable us to appreciate it. We said this to the first service, grace without truth is like when someone pulls up next to you and they're like, hey, do you know how to get to Sleep Train Arena? And you're like, the Lord be with you. And they're like, what? Hey, do you know how to get to the in and out? God bless you, dear sister, brother, friend, whatever, you know. Like, and they're just looking at you like, all I wanted was directions, okay? So I don't know what you're doing or whatever, but I just need to know where to go. 
Um, that is what it's like to have grace without truth. You're kind, you're loving, that's cool, but you are pointless and purposeless. There's nothing, there's no good, true good, that you'll lead a person to without the truth that they desperately need. Romans 10.14 says this, How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? Grace opens the door, but truth is like the, the whole enchilada. It's the main meal. It's the real thing. It's what's most essential. Grace gets us there. Grace gains us an audience. All the good things and the, 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 the love that we pour out. But without the truth, there's, again, just no point, no purpose. Jesus said the truth. The gospel is the narrow way by which we must enter if we want to be saved. Listen, grace invites everyone to come to that narrow way, but the truth is nonetheless a narrow way by which you must enter if you want to have life and be saved. Amen? Grace without truth, love without truth, can really send the wrong message to people, can't it? If you're kind and loving, and that's great. Accepting and tolerating and embracing and all this good stuff. You know salvation's the issue and not sin. Good for you. Good job. Keep it up. But if you never get to the truth, what's the, what's the point? What's the purpose? If we're not careful, if we're only preachers and demonstrators of grace and love, you're going to usher a person happily straight into hell. You're going to enable them to live a sinful lifestyle and burn for all eternity. That's not good, right? You ever meet someone like that, a brother or sister? You know, it's like anything anyone else does, they're just praising and cheering. And Man, I ran over someone in the parking lot on my way and bless the Lord, brother, you know, good for you. Keep it up, good work. I mean, and anything that's said, it's affirming. Good, man. You know, at some point there's got to be some truth that enters the equation here or we're not doing people a service at all. Combining the truth, backing up the grace that we share, the love that we truly have with the truth of the word of God. And the truth is simply this, right? We're sinners. We're born that way into the world. But as we read the good news, is that God has sent his son to die for our sin, to pay the price so that we can live. Faith, trust in Jesus Christ. That gains us salvation, the gift of salvation. Grace without truth will never transform babes in Christ into mature, productive adults. There's got to be some truth inserted, man. My little girl, when we serve her, my wife serves her, beautiful bowl of oatmeal, love me some oatmeal with blueberries on top. She just eats the blueberries and pushes away the uh, oatmeal. Now that's nice, that's fun, right? But it's no way to live. Man, you gotta get in the nutrients, you gotta dig down deep, you, deep. you can't have one without the other. And when they're so beautifully tied together, well, it's just an enjoyable experience, right? Jesus said, John 17, verse 17, and we'll wrap this up. He's praying for his disciples, and in this, he's praying for us. And he said to the Father, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. Sanctify them, set them apart. Enable them to like live in the world, but not be like the world. Enable them to serve the world, to minister the, to, the, to the world, to be different, to be like me, and here's how you're going to do it. Set them apart by the truth, your word is truth. And thus, it's not the grace, it's not the love alone that sets us apart. That's part of it, but it's the truth of God's word. That's our passion. That's how we live. Those are the, the, the guiding principles of our life. Grace just kind of eases the process in, doesn't it? Without the word of God, we would live purpose, uh, purposeless, joyless lives. We wouldn't know where to go and what to do and every other such thing. Uh, the word of God is, is what uh, ushers in the promises of the Lord that we love so much like we read earlier. 
It's the word of God that's a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. It's the sole source of truth in our generation, and we can't live without it. We love the word. Got to have the Bible. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's the key, right? But again, bringing it to a close. Without that grace, without that love, this truth alone will turn us into those that Jesus dealt so harshly with, those scribes, those Pharisees, those religious individuals, so self-righteous but so lacking in mercy. Uh, Compassion was absent. There was no purpose to their existence because all they did was push people with the truth away from the Lord as opposed to drawing them to the Lord by love and grace and then imparting truth so appropriately. It can't be one or the other. It's got to be both. And that's hard, right? How do I do this? This seems so hard, you know, to stand just firmly built and grounded in the truth of God's word, uh, the authority that it is. And yet, administering that word in the grace, the kindness, the goodness, the, the love of the Lord, I mean, that seems just impossible. Uh, I think in many ways it is. How about you? I mean, I'm so good at one or the other, but to juggle them both is, oh, oh. but that's exactly what our life is to be, right? I need someone, something higher than me, stronger than me. I need a, a, a spirit to govern over me. I need something that I don't have to do what God has called me to do. And I'm so thankful that the one who sits before us is the one who's going to enable us if we ask him to. Remember why John is writing chapter 1 and the rest of this wonderful gospel. It's, it's a lesson in how Jesus walked in so beautifully, both the, the truth of God that's unchanging, never-ending, and the grace of God that administers it so, so beautifully, perfectly. I'll give you three passages that you can digest this afternoon and this week. John chapter 4, we see how Jesus applied, balanced grace and truth so beautifully. John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman at the well. By Jesus' presence, by his, you know, asking for a drink of water, that's offensive, it's inappropriate. Uh, It shouldn't have ever been. Uh, And yet he did that. He risked his reputation all the time, didn't he? There were those who said, you know, you eat with sinners, and so you're sinners, and you can't do this, and you can't go there. And Jesus just blew them all out of the water. He just did it anyway. But he didn't compromise the truth, did he? No, he shared it directly. John chapter 8, the woman caught in the act of adultery. This whole thing was a setup, we know. But her sin is not the issue. Grace, love, the extension, the the invitation, that's what it is. Go and sin no more. Let's learn something about grace and truth from that. My favorite is John chapter 21, where Peter meets with Jesus and is restored to ministry. Peter denied Jesus three times. He cursed and swore, I've never met the man. I don't know him. And then their eyes locked and Jesus overheard the whole thing and he was well aware of what went on and it was just, wow, I can't, I can't consider, I can't think of a lower point for any of us to have, right? The depression, the discouragement, I mean, to the point of like suicidal thoughts. I mean, this is radical failure. And yet when Jesus meets with Peter, he doesn't bring it up, he doesn't touch it. It's as though grace covered it all. He doesn't say, Peter, did I say this yet? Drop and give me 20. Go swim a mile. You know, you got to make this up. You're going to have to do some stuff to, you know, pay this off or whatever. Doesn't even talk about it. Peter doesn't say, oh, and God forgive me and bestoweth your grace upon me and get all religious and stuff. Just doesn't even talk about it. They don't even address it. That's grace. That's radical to me. You don't have to bring it up. Don't have to talk about it. Don't have to address it. But Jesus commissions him and he says, now, now that I have your sin covered, this Uh, Sin is satisfied, righteously satisfied by my Father, through my body, through my blood. Go and serve my people. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Take care of my people. It's just beautiful. So I pray you take those things and we consider them and put them to work. Lastly, as the Word teaches us, we have to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. But oftentimes, we have to earn an audience. Do you know that? You do. We have to 
earn an audience by just gracious living, being nice to people. It seems that sometimes this is just a lost art. Listening. Don't dominate conversations. Ask questions. I can't tell you more stories, and we're out of time anyway. But isn't it just the weirdest thing when you sit down with, with some Christians? And maybe this is you. I'm, I don't know, so I don't want to offend you. We just think we're know-it-alls, man. We have all the answers, and I don't need to listen to you. You're not a saved person. I don't want to hear your story. I'll be infected with your sin cooties. Sinners don't have cooties, right? Oh, I, I can't talk to that person. I can't invite them over to my house because the, the, the Bible says do not fellowship. That's not what it means. Invite some like crazy pagan out to dinner and just listen and ask them questions. And uh, oftentimes, this is what we need. And guys, this is what grace affords us. The opportunity to earn an audience, to gain a listening ear by just being nice. Doesn't matter what the sin is. Matters who the Savior is. Amen? Amen. Lord, help us, we pray. We live in a real tricky culture and a generation, God, in which we desperately need to stand on your truth. We are unwavering. We are unashamed. But God, we've got to balance it like you do with grace. Lord, grace that opens all the doors and knows no limits, borders, boundaries. The power of God. Help us, we pray. These things are impossible for us. We're going to look to you and we're going to depend on you. We're going to encourage others to look at you too. We're not going to, Lord, be quick to judge. We're not going to be critical. We're going to cheer one another on as we seek to save the world. Thank you, God. Remind us today, Lord, that though we invite people to church, they might never come. They're not comfortable here, but they might come over for dinner. They might go out for some ribs or tofu burgers. So God, help us to become all things to all men. Lord, to be an ambassador for Christ, just to get creative and just to be, Lord, kind and to speak the truth in love. Lord, would you give us a passion for lost souls? Would you help us to just break through these religious walls? Speak to us, lead us, equip us. And God bless your people. Would this be just the greatest week they've ever had in you? Would you remind them how much you love them and how much grace they're afforded through your blood? Would you bless our celebrations this week? And we're so thankful for a country, Lord, in which we can still freely worship. Thank you, Lord. Bless your people. In Jesus' name we say, amen.